recording this presentation using Ustream. So we've got two different recordings going on right now. We've got the Jing recording, which is happening. That's what I started off right at the very beginning here. And uh, that will be saved as a flash file. I did some testing. I'm estimating the flash file will come in at 1.12 gigabytes, give or take. Um, and of course, I'm recording this video on Ustream. For those of you who are watching on Ustream, I've set up the uh, screen here so that you can see the screen all right. So sometimes you'll see me, and sometimes you'll see the screen. We're just going to go back and forth like that. People who are in Ustream may chat back to themselves back and forth in this chat room. So, But I'm not wanting you guys to do that. For one thing, I don't think we want 30 or so uh, live streaming videos. Particularly, we don't want 30 or so live streaming videos of something that's happening right in front of you. Uh, although that really is the Web 2.0 way. So I'm going to move this off down here and just keep that out of the way here and I'll move this over here. For all of you here, this is a little application I call C-Chat. It's something I built myself, so I'm very proud of it naturally. It's part of a, a more widespread application that we'll be looking at through this uh, presentation called Grasshopper. And uh, for those of you who have your computers with you, there's a, a good number which is nice. If you go to this URL, you will be presented with a screen. And so let's do that. We'll just go down to that CA, CGI, hyphen bin, cchat.cgi. One thing I didn't have time to do this morning at 5 a.m. is go into my server and do a little redirect to make this a nice short URL, but I will one day. And yes, it's C chat, not C H hat. So let's get that right. And you'll be presented with a screen that looks remarkably like this. And you type in your message. And so I'm going to type in the message and we'll submit. And the messages start showing up on the screen. So this is your way to take part in this presentation. I'll keep that screen up there. I've done that before. In fact, I did this last year at Brendan Hall. We all had a good laugh uh, because people were irresponsible. But now you know <laughs> that this presentation is being recorded. Um, because I'm doing a screencasting, the... Uh, the uh, text that you're typing there will be saved in the screencast. The uh, people who are at home, and we'll see how we're doing there. Oops, that's not it. Oh, I moved this over too far. Or, oh, I moved it way over too far. Where did it go? I hope I didn't close it. There we go. The people are, we got three people online now. I'm very impressed. Uh... You can go to that URL, downs.ca slash CGI bin slash cchat.cgi, and I'll just type that out. Oh, okay. Well, uh, we're not. Okay. <laughs> I hate that. All right, well, now we're not recording in Jing anymore. That's too bad. Well, I'll save that, anyways. We're still recording on uh, Ustream, though. Ustream will keep going the whole time. Keep getting, I don't know why you're being asked for a password. Oops. Then, there we go. Now, uh, this person who's online is saying they're being asked for a password. I have no idea why they're being asked for a password. So, a uh, person who's online, I can't help you about the password. Uh, I certainly haven't asked for a password. Uh, we'll come back to that. Like I said, it worked well in the hotel room. I've had th two things break already. Okay, so we got some people who are, are chatting now. 
And let's let's get my video back up here. I've lost my video. So there we go. So what I want to talk to you today about, if you're not seeing other people's comments yet, it's because they haven't commented yet. What's going to happen with this message board here is that when you type a comment, it will show show up here on the screen for 10 seconds, and then it will go away. And that way, it's first come, first serve. So you, you type in your comment, and then you wait until it's your turn. There's also an archive of all the comments that have been made, well, ever, because I've never cleaned it out. Uh, and you can view the chat archives here in the, uh, in the text form, on the text form screen. So if you find yourself lagging behind, you can always uh, take a look at the chat archive and uh, keep up. Now what you're seeing, which admittedly isn't working perfectly, I've already lost my Jing recording because I was too cheap to pay them money and didn't realize that it timed out after five minutes because I haven't recorded that long before, which really is annoying to me. Um, this is a personal learning environment. Uh, you might have thought reading the description that a personal learning environment was some kind of software that you were going to come in and see, um, but that's not really what it is. A personal learning environment is a way of viewing learning on the web where we're not centered on one application, we're not centered on one perspective, rather we've got stuff going on all over the place. There's a chair there in that corner and there's a chair there in that second last row and that's what I see. Oh, and there's a chair right there in the second row here. Or you can stand if you prefer. That's the, the other thing about personal learning environments is people uh, adjust their learning to their own tastes. So if standing works for you, perfect. So, of course, I don't usually do my uh, personal learning environment stuff while I'm on, while I'm standing here in front of you. I do my personal learning stuff in my own office at home. So, what is my personal learning environment at home? You may wonder. Well, here's what it is. It's uh, a place to to store and share my photos, something like Flickr. It's a place to store and share my videos, such as. Uh, YouTube, or I tend to use Google Video because Google Video allowed me to upload 500 megabyte videos, which I thought was very nice of them. It's a place to work with my colleague using something like Google Docs and to write a paper together, both of us working on the same document at the same time. He's in Montreal, I'm in Moncton. It's a way to stay up to date, to stay right up to date, and uh, if you wonder what, this is another view of my personal learning environment. I think you'll like this because it's a lot of fun. This is Google Reader. How many of you use Google Reader or an RS Reader of some sort? Oh, three, four, five people maybe? Now it's going to take a few seconds here because uh, we're in this wireless room here. So there's Google Reader, and uh, I've got 562 items waiting in the cyber culture category. And I'm going to have, well, only six in design, 388 in edu bloggers, because I was reading them during the talk this morning, and so on. This is how I keep in touch with my community on the web. Each one of these corresponds to a web blog out there. Each web blog corresponds to somebody working in the field of education technology. This is EduBlogs by Ewan McIntosh. He's in uh, Scotland. I read people from all over the world. It doesn't take as long as you might think. If you were trying to keep up with uh, 300 uh, websites and another 500 websites, you would find it impossible. But with something like Google Reader, you just read what's convenient to you. It's very easy to keep up with all of these different sites because they're all in the same place. Google Reader works using something called RSS, which you may have heard of. 
uh, about before. RSS is a technology that brings information that's in all of these uh, uh, distributed websites and brings it together for me. So that's part of my personal learning environment. We'll put that back down there. It's a way to save on phone calls. When I woke up at 5 o'clock this morning, one of the first things I did is I logged on to Skype and I gave my wife a call. My wife is in Moncton on the other side of North America. Total cost of, I don't know, 30, 40, whatever minute call, zero. You got to like that. For me, my uh, personal learning environment is knowing where I'm staying before I get there. This is a very simple little picture from Google Maps. And I did the uh, uh, same thing here. I uh, Google Maps uh, San Jose. I looked up the address of this hotel and knew exactly where I was going well before I got here. So I was able to actually give directions while we were in the cab from the airport to the hotel because I had looked it all up beforehand. It's an easy way to draw pictures. This is a website called Gliffy.com. It probably times out after five minutes too. I'm really annoyed by that. I don't want to have to pay for this stuff because I have no money. <laughs> Other people have budgets. Right? We have internal competitions like at NRC where I work just like everywhere else and I really don't like competition so I don't apply so I don't get research budget so I don't have any money which means I have to do all this stuff for free. All of this stuff that I'm showing you is free. I don't believe in paying for this stuff because, well, I can't. Uh, so Gliffy is an easy way to draw pictures. I've used this quite a bit, actually. And what you see in that, in that Gliffy image there is a picture of a personal learning environment that I drew using Gliffy. It's actually kind of small there, but if you were to do a search on it, you would be able to find it. I wonder if I can... I want to be careful about time here. because When I give a talk, I do get distracted and uh, you know, I want to go into websites and things, but I know I have a certain amount of time, so I need to be careful. At least I'm not worried about Jing creating a... Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Ustream is still recording, though, and uh, we're 10 minutes and 4 seconds into this. So let's, uh, let's check on the Ustreamers and see how we're doing there. Hi, Ustreamers. Uh, we're up to, looks like, 3, 6, 8 of you, 9 of you. You stream bot? Hmm, that's kind of worrying. So, and this, of course, is what the people in Ustream are seeing. So we've got some people who've been coming in. Um, you yeah, know, it's the internet. They're not going to last an hour and 15 minutes. You guys will, because everybody will see you leaving if you don't. But internet, they come, they go, you never see them. I missed it. <laughs> and it's right here, too. This, this isn't nearly as good as it was. Like I had it all set up like this. I thought, great, and now my Jing will record this, and it'll be like this, this great presentation. That I can, and now it's not recording, and I still have this. Anyhow, I may have to. I'm doing a talk tomorrow. I'm going to try to do it like this again tomorrow. Only I may actually fork over the money to be able to afford to record on the screen. We'll see. Maybe I can get my uh, supervisor to pay for it. Um, what do personal learning environments mean for, lear mean for learners? Well, probably first and foremost what they mean is a world full of free learning resources. Uh, this is a uh, conference full of commercial e-learning providers and the word that is probably heresy to commercial e-learning providers is free. Um, but uh, you're going to have to deal with that. Already we're seeing, we'll see tomorrow, um, hundreds, thousands of free learning resources out there. Some of these learning resources are very good, and people, learners who are out there, just eat them up like candy. And it's getting harder and harder to get anyone to pay for this sort of stuff that you can get for free online. Now... <clears throat> Sorry about that. Here's you, 
you want to think about these resources a bit carefully. There's three major ways of viewing these learning resources that are online. The typical way, um, one chair right there. The, the typical way of viewing these resources is to think of them as a thing, as an object. And indeed, many of us are even involved in the creation of learning objects. Thinking of them as though they were books. A second way of thinking about these learning resources is to think of them very much like this session here, as an event. But neither of those really are the best way of thinking of learning resources online. When you're thinking of learning resources online, you want to move away from the traditional information theoretic and medium-based models. You want to get away from the idea that they are static. You want to get away from the idea that they are like objects. And think instead of learning resources as a flow. And this, this will have a big impact on the discussion of open educational resources tomorrow. But even now, think about how this is set up. Um, it's very much a flow. It's very much I'm using resources that I grabbed today. If they're not available tomorrow, who cares? It doesn't really matter. Uh, I used what I had today. It worked for today. That was the learning today. Tomorrow there will be a whole new set of resources, and I'll use them. Similarly, the people who are online, uh, you know, they're probably not saving this online presentation. I'd be very surprised if they were. I am recording it, but I don't expect a whole lot of people to be viewing the recording in, in a year or two years, whatever from now. I don't expect anybody to be viewing the recording because there will be other better recordings. We hear a lot of talk when we're talking about learning resources about things like persistence and stability and reliability and all of that sort of thing. But in a world where these learning resources are being produced hundreds of thousands every day, we don't need that anymore. And indeed, it should change our attitude toward these learning resources. They come, they go. They, they, they're as permanent as that hello world up there on the screen. And there it goes. So what does this sort of world look like? Well, as we saw at the keynote this morning, it's a world of user-generated content. user-generated content is photos, it's videos, it's animations, it's games, it's text, it's whatever. And user-generated content is personal, it's written from a certain perspective or a certain point of view, and it is typically opinionated. And that's its value. It's a network of interactions. It's people communicating with people, people linking to people, people sending information back and forth with each other. It's immersive learning. The personal learning environment is the sort of thing that follows you. So if you're playing a game, your learning environment is available. If you're working uh, with uh, uh, a performance support system. Your learning environment is available. And the idea here is that your learning environment should be available inside these environments. So you immerse yourself, you do things inside one of these environments, and your learning is available right there. There are new roles in this learning environment. New roles for students as creators of learning. Did I miss something again? <laughs> new <laughs> New roles for, for teachers as coaches and mentors, as people who model and demonstrate and, and provide an example for learners. And for the rest of us, in whatever job we're doing, in this kind of connected environment, we all become teachers. And this is, this is a perspective I don't think people are quite ready for yet, but I think it's something that we'll see. Because everybody is hyper-connected, because everybody can produce media even video media like this, on the fly, with free tools, with just with the computer they're carrying around, they can do their work in a very open and public way. And this openness and this publicness, if that's a word, becomes a value. A person who is, say, a welder, who has a video camera and shows himself welding, because that's what you do, right? You just set up your video camera, everyone has one, and you know, what's, the, what's he doing today? He's welding. And 
And so that creates live dynamic learning resources for anybody in the world who is interested in welding. Me, not so much. But there are people there who are interested in welding and want to watch people doing welding. There are people online who are interested in this topic and who want to watch this talk take place um, as it progresses. The idea here is that everybody, and not just a, a certain select, specially trained set of people, becomes a teacher. Everybody in this world as well, and we've, we've heard this before, becomes a learner. It's a web of user-generated content. We see Wikipedia today, and that's only, I think, an early example. From, from my perspective, far more interesting are the, are the millions, the billions of web pages describing how to do this, describing how to do that. I wonder how best practices rise out of the noise of everyone sharing ideas and opinions. I'm reading off the screen. I guess the onus is on the something. <laughs> Well, I'm going to talk about that, but I want let, let me let me uh, give you a bit of a preview. The idea here is that every is that people are connected to each other in a web of connections. Now, it's not the case that everybody is connected to everybody. Think more along the lines of social networks, where you are connected to your friends. Your network of friends becomes your filter. Your network of friends becomes the thing. That highlights things for you. So if something really good comes along, somebody flags it and passes it on to their friend. And then they pass it on to their friend and so on and so on and so on. It's like that Trident commercial or whatever commercial it was ages ago. I forget what it was. Boy, that was a long time ago. Never mind. Uh, I don't know if any of you even saw that. How many of you, if I, it's shampoo? It was, thank you. I don't know why I remember that. I have theories, though. <laughs> but anyhow, so the preview to that is it's the structure of the web of interactions that creates the filter. And the way we build this web of interactions will affect how well or how poorly this web filters content. Right now, the Internet, as constructed, not so good, which is why we have all those things like spam and other, su other such stuff. Learning in this picture becomes a network phenomenon. What I mean by that is learning becomes the immersion of oneself in a network, the immersion of oneself in a community of practice. We have the plumbers demonstrating their plumbing online, and we have people practicing plumbing and putting that online, and other people looking at them practicing their plumbing and critiquing it. And that's online as well. So you're, you're immersing yourself in this web of interactions where this web of interactions is composed of people who are interested in or who are doing the same sort of thing that you're doing, whatever that may happen to be at that particular time. Let's see how we're doing online here. And we're down to six people. But we're still holding in there. We had a peak of eight that we saw. Now, the issues, again, the big issue, as was mentioned in the chat before, too much information. How do we filter the information? But there are other issues as well. Too many sources to scan, even. Uh, there's a million people, a billion people who are producing content online. Nobody can follow all of that. And then the entire question of localization, personalization, or relevance. The way I address this is through something that may be labeled under the heading network semantics. And this is the principle of how you build these networks in order to build a reliable personal learning environment. I'll make this a wee bit bigger. There we go. Network semantics is based on the idea that some kinds of networks are more reliable than other kinds of networks. For example, 
some kinds of networks can produce what are known as cascade phenomena, where uh, everybody starts doing the same sort of thing. I'll give you an example of that. The spread of disease in a society is an example of a cascade phenomenon. Uh, one person gets a disease, and then it spreads to another person, another person. Sooner or later, everybody in society has this disease. Or another example, the way a rumor might spread through a community. One person says, the dam's going to break, and then sooner or later, everybody comes to believe it. Um, or even something like lemmings jumping off a cliff, although that's somewhat apocryphal. But the thing is here, if your network is too tightly joined, if, you're, if your network is such that everybody in the network can be exposed to something in a very quick time or in a very short number of hops, um, then something can spread through the network very rapidly. So what you want is a network that is set up so that ideas don't propagate rapidly from one person to the next. You want to create a network that will slow down the propagation of ideas, that will create, if you will, communities that are, I don't want to say insulated from each other because that's not really what I mean, but, but they're more or less insulated from each other so that instead of one idea rapidly rushing through a network, you have enough time for alternative ideas to spread as well. So if one idea spreads in one part of the network, another idea spreads in another part of the network, and because it takes a certain amount of time for these things to propagate, that allows for, well, I don't want to say the best because that's too much of a value judgment, but that, that allows for both of them to have an equal chance of being represented in the network. The... The principles for the creation of networks that, that are, are formed in this way fall under what I call the, the semantic principle. And the semantic principle is based on the idea that it governs the, the creation of networks or the design of networks that are the most reliable in this way, that are the least likely to produce cascade phenomena, but the most likely to allow for the spread of information. If you think about it, it's, it's kind of... Uh, a middle point, right? You need some connectivity because if nothing's connected, no information gets spread. But if you have too much connectivity, too much information gets spread right away. That's the state that we're in right now with the internet. We have too much connectivity, if you can believe it. But there's a middle point where we have just the right amount of connectivity, and that is the point that prevents the cascade phenomena. That is the point that is semantically reliable. So, the semantic principle describes that kind of network, and the semantic principle is composed of four major elements. The first of these elements is autonomy, the idea that each, each node in the network, each individual in the network, each person who has a personal learning environment is autonomous. They're making their own decisions, they're, they're choosing their own software. They're working according to their own values. And this is a very important concept of the personal learning environment. Typically, when we talk about learning software, we're talking about learning software that is owned and controlled by an institution, Blackboard, WebCT, whatever. But the idea of a personal learning environment is that it's owned and controlled by an individual, by a student. I'm just going to pop in here. I guess I don't need to worry. Oh, boy, I want to keep your comments up here. So, And for those of you who are on the Internet, I'm going to grsshopper.downs.ca. This is a personal learning environment. And... Uh, this is, in fact, my own personal learning environment, <coughs> and it's going to be slow, probably because I'm still recording video. And it's going to make me log in, of course. Come on. 
there's, there's actually a faster way of doing this. Oops. This is what you get if you log in. I'm going to cover up the comments because nobody's making any. That's an interesting thing. I don't know why nobody's saying anything. So what this is, this is my personal learning environment. And if I was a student, I would have one of these. Each person has one of these. And basically, it's a place where I create and I manage my own content. On the left-hand side there, that's the list of types of content that are relevant to me. This list of types of content is unique for each person. Other people who are working or have different kinds of, of, of enterprises have different kinds of content. To me, you know, I write, I give talks, I do stuff like that. So I have things like um, presentations and posts and so on. Um, so... Here's my list of presentations, for example. Here's a presentation that I gave just the other day. And you see how this personal learning environment is working. Again, it's, it's my personal environment. It's my site. It's my center. But now, this I don't know why this down arrow refuses to work. It's really, really annoying. It's very strange, too. So... What you can see here is a slideshow of a presentation that I gave a little while ago. It's just your typical flash slideshow. And uh, hang on, let me just help out the, uh, the poor people who are online. Oops, there we go. And here's where I am now, people, who are following online. So now they can keep up. This slideshow is stored on a site called SlideShare. Um, and what I did is I created the slideshow. Then I uploaded it to SlideShare. SlideShare.net, uh, for those of you who are following it. And, and uh, we'll, we'll have it here in a second. Here, here it is on SlideShare. And it'll be slightly bigger. And the idea... Oh, it'll be a lot bigger. <laughs> They've... Well, that's right. I'm not used to using that digital projector, which gives me a much smaller screen than I'm used to. And so now I can just do my, uh, my slideshow. This slideshow is kind of interesting because it describes a, a course that George Siemens and I are doing online right now. And this is the thing about personal learning environment. It's not just a place where you learn. It's not a place where you consume content. It's a place where you create content. And so, in order to offer this course online, in fact, I actually used an instance of Grasshopper to provide quite a bit of the material for that course. So I'm going to hop into that now. Oops. Now, that's the website connect.downs.ca. And this, this is very typical of working in a personal learning environment. You notice how I'm just bouncing from thing to thing to thing. Slowly, because of the internet connection. So here's the course. Here's the daily, which is the newsletter that's used in the course. And here's my personal learning environment that we use to manage the course. And as you can see, it looks very similar to the one that I use to manage my own website. And I share this personal learning environment with George, George Siemens, who's the other person uh, providing the course. So here, another type of content element that we can look at are the pages. These are just pages of content that we offer to people. One of the pages that we use is a page that collects the contributions of the members of, of the course. Uh, I need to find it here. It's the blog posts page. And this is what the blog post page looks like in the editor. I, as, the, as one of the owners of the site, have the editor. And it doesn't look like much, right? It's, it's that, that's it. That's just the keyword and, and so on. But what that is doing is providing this system with a short little command 
saying, here's what I want you to display on this page. And then when I view the generated version of the page, what we're going to see are the blog posts that have been created by people who are members of the course. Now these people aren't using this system. These people are using whatever. A blogger, type pad, WordPress, who knows? I don't even care because they're using their own system. And the idea here of Grasshopper uh, is that it aggregates. And that's what a personal learning environment does. It aggregates content from elsewhere on the web and then it stores it in a way that's convenient for me to use to create my own content. So what I've done is I've stored the RSS feeds from these other remote sites and I've presented them here on my own site. And so these are all the contributions from all these different people. And I can, well, just, I can keep going on and on and on and it goes on and on and on. These are the feeds that I harvest from. Again, this is something that's personal. This is my choice. It's not, I'm not using uh, you know, some sort of pre-selected list of sources uh, here because uh, George and I are offering this course. It's the list of feeds being produced by the students. If I was a student in this course, I could have the list of feeds produced by other students or by a selection perhaps suggested by the instructor, perhaps suggested by other students. Each person selects their own list of feeds themselves based on the information they get from other people, based on suggestions, recommendations, and whatever they happen to find out there on the internet. So the first principle was autonomy. And as you can see, the idea of the personal learning environment, one of the core design principles of the personal learning environment is to provide autonomy for the individual learner. Autonomy of sources, autonomy of software, whatever they want. The second principle is diversity. And this is a very important principle because it goes against what may be our natural grain or our natural inclination. Typically, we're told, typically we're, we're told when we're working in a class or in a company or something like that, that it is sameness that is going to define the community, sameness that is going to define the define collaboration or the project or whatever. Corporations themselves have vision statements that they expect every employee to, uh, well, to buy into. In a network, though, the strength of the network comes not from sameness, not from identity, but rather from diversity. Now, if you think about it, with billions of sources of information out there on the internet, it is not going to be possible for any individual to be able to comprehend all of those information sources. In our course, the course that George and I are, are offering, we have about 2,200 students in the course. It is not possible for an individual to comprehend everything that's going on in that course. And so the question becomes, how do we know anything? How can we learn anything in that kind of environment? And the answer that's suggested in this model is that, in essence, we divide up the task. Nobody tries to encompass everything. Nobody tries to, to read everything, to understand everything. People select the information that they find the most interesting, they find the most relevant, uh, or they find even just simply the most convenient to access. People define their own perspective, their own point of view, and then they communicate with everyone else. And what happens is that a perspective, knowledge, if you will, emerges 
in a society as a whole as a consequence of those conversations. And then you as a person, a participant in that conversation, observe that network, that community, and see what sort of knowledge emerges out of that. Now, you're not going to be able to comprehend that knowledge. It's going to be too much for you to comprehend. But you can have an idea that the society has that knowledge. I'll give you an example. Because it's kind of a rough concept to get a hold of, isn't it? Think about how to transport a person from London to New York in less than eight hours. That can be done. It's, it's miraculous. I can't believe it can be done. But I've been told it can be done. Well, there's a lot to know here, right? Uh, one of the things you need to know is how to build an aircraft successfully. One that takes off and lands intact. Uh, you, you need to know, well, think about what you need to know to build an aircraft. You need tires, you need glass windows, you need seats, um, you need those little DVDs, or, never mind. Uh, you know, you need all kinds of things in order to build an aircraft. I personally have no idea how to build glass windows. I uh, bet you none of you do either. Well, maybe someone does. But, um, and then after you've built the aircraft, you have to know how to fly it. And you have to have the ability to navigate it. You have to be able to take care of all those people who are sitting on the aircraft. You have to be able to repair the aircraft if it's broken. You can get the idea, right? There's hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of separate little bits of things you need to know in order to transport a person from London to New York in under eight hours. We know how to do it. We as a society know how, knows how to do it. But no individual knows how to do it. No individual could possibly have all of that knowledge. But each of us, working on the things that interest us, some people are really into glass making. Excellent. They can do the windows. Other people, rubber. That's their thing. They'll do the tires. Um, other people like to fly things, so they can be the pilot. Each of us has these different things, but again, what's really important is not simply that each of us has our own perspective, our own point of view. We still wouldn't have an airplane if we had that. We also have to have the communication in, in, the, in the network. So diversity is critical, but diversity <coughs> has to be joined with connectedness, and that's the third principle. The idea that the knowledge results from the connectedness of all of the people. And we're not simply adding it up. We're not simply piling bits of knowledge one on top of the other. Rather, we're creating a web of interactions, and it is out of this web of interactions that the knowledge of how to move a person from London to New York is produced. Now, if you think about that, and this is a wee bit of an aside, but if you think about that, if we govern ourselves as a society that way, it looks very different from the way we govern ourselves now. You might say, well, how can that be, right? Don't we have the best form of government in the world? Well, so far. Although we've learned recently that it has its, its flaws. The form of government we have now is a form of government based on replication and mass. It is, it is a form of government that is based on quantity. That's what democracy as, as we know it is. Democracy is the vote, right? And the vote is based on sameness. The people who can get the most votes of the same type, they get to run the show. But imagine if we ran our airline that way. Think about it. Uh, windows are pretty popular. So Windows gets lots of supports. Those little tiny wires in the seats that run the uh, run the TV screens, not popular at all. Nobody's interested in that. So they don't get any votes. So what happens? We have a vote. Window guy wins. Right? Now, window guy's in charge of building and running this airline. You can see the problem right there. Window guy is not prepared. But because... We selected a leader based on sameness and mass, we get window guy. That was just an accident. I don't mean to compare that to Microsoft. Don't infer anything there. <laughs> well, must, maybe it was in the bathroom. 
never mind. <laughs> but but you see you see the distinction. If we govern ourselves as a network where nobody's in charge, but people do the different things that they do, then you can build an airplane because you have all of the knowledge as a network. But if you're trying to set up your system where you're, you're just simply counting votes, you get the best individual, but you don't get the best possible result. So I think that we're going to go through a period in society where we come to this realization. And I think it'll be a difficult period, but I think out the other end, we'll get better forms of government. That's what I think anyways. Finally, the fourth principle, the network is open. The idea here is that there are not barriers to joining the network. There, are not, there is not a clear line or a clear division point between being in the network and being out of the network. And the idea here is that being open allows the network to get input from new places, new sources, uh, new perspective, new points of view. It allows the network to be fluid, to be dynamic. And so I made a comment to some people, and it hadn't struck me like this before, but they're organizing a conference, and there's a community of them, and the, so what they did basically is they picked the most prominent people in their community, and those were their keynote speakers. And then they did it the next year, and they did the same thing. It's the same people. They're in their third year now. It's the same people again. And it occurred to me, not that I wanted to criticize these people particularly, but when a community of people is having a conference, what they want to do is get people from outside that community to speak to them. They want their community to be open this way because otherwise the community becomes what they call an, e an echo chamber, right? They just hear the same ideas over and over because they're working from the same information, the same perspectives and points of view. So the idea here is that your network is open to new perspectives, open to new ideas. Open means a lot of things. And again, I'll talk a bit more about that tomorrow. But open means not just different people, but different ways of doing things. In the technological world, it means different software systems, uh, different environments. It means Mac and Windows and Linux and whatever else may be out there. OS X, I guess there's still a few OS Xs out there. Ooh, big comment. I'm not going to be able to read it fast enough. Many networks online are not open in terms, exactly, and that's a criticism. And that becomes something that we can look at these networks online. We come back, we go back to this course. We pop back into this course. This course is called a MOOC, which is kind of a silly name. It stands for Massive Open Online Course. And the idea was that anybody who was interested in the topic could join the course. And one of the interesting things I've noticed so far about the course is that different communities that are inside the course behave differently. This course has a bunch of different technologies. Again, we're trying to be open. We wanted people to be able to use as many different technologies as they wanted, and we wanted to, to in some way support that. So we set up in the course, we set up a course blog, we set up a course Moodle forum, a mailing list, a PageFlakes site. PageFlakes is a, a type of RSS aggregator. And this PageFlakes site is aggregating posts about the course from Delicious, from Flickr, from other services online. We've been having discussions online, Ustream sessions, and we see the Ustream session for this uh, session here. Twitter, even though I don't use Twitter a whole lot, we supported Twitter. And then the students set up their own places as well. The students set up uh, their own Twitter thing. They set up their own Flickr site with images for the course. I haven't looked at that recently, so I probably shouldn't let myself be distracted like this. But here are images that people in the course have been making. 
they've been drawing networks as you can see and you can also see some images there's a second life component that started up and is managing itself I haven't even been into the second life component of the course people have been creating Wordle documents as well here's Wordle Wordle is kind of a neat thing what you do with Wordle is you take any page of text and you feed the URL into Wordle.com and Wordle.com gives you a neat diagram. The bigger the word is, the more frequently it was used. And it's, I guess it's a gestalt kind of thing, right? That's not for everyone, but it's for some people. Actually, I think it's Wordle.net. Is it Wordle.net? Thank you. And they've created a, a course in Dejo, which is a site, a social networking site that allows you to annotate web pages. And they created a Ning. They were talking about the Brandon Hall Ning. Well, Nings can be used by anyone because they're, again, free. And so some students set up a Ning for the course. And it's interesting to look. All of these are organized differently. They're all efforts at networking, but they're all slightly different. The Moodle that we have in the course is the most traditional. It's a traditional threaded discussion list. It's organized hierarchically, so you have the course, and then the major topics, and the subtopics, and the threads, and the replies, and so on. You've seen threaded discussion lists. And that's the site. The Moodle is where the loudest voices are drowning everyone else out. It's really interesting to see. There's, there's about three or four people who have between them maybe 80% of the posts and and you know and of course they hate each other <laughs> so and, and that's the, that's the kind of conversation you get in that kind of environment as compared to the blogs where there's about uh, I think we're up to about 114 blogs that are being produced by individuals in the course the uh, number of posts per blogger is much lower. The, the distribution of blogs is much, much more even. And, you know, we, 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 again, I'm talking about these, these principles, openness, diversity, etc. We can evaluate a network based on the shape of the network. And by the shape of the network, what I mean is graphs of various properties of the network. Now, if you take, for example... The, the Moodle discussion. And if you graph that, if uh, on if you know, if on the uh, the x-axis you just have number of people, and on the y-axis you have numbers of posts, right? So what you get is a few people have a lot of posts, and then a lot of people have very few posts. It's a it's a classic what they call a they call a power law graph. And it just looks like this. That's what you get when you have hierarchically structured networks. And you, you can read Clay Shirky on power laws. Uh, the internet, if you look at a network diagram of the internet, the internet looks like a hub and spokes. A hub and spokes is logically exactly the same network structure as you see in a Moodle forum which is exactly the same network structure as you see in a hierarchy. And that's why you get this network phenomena with a few people who have all of the voice or all of the resources or whatever, and many people who have very few. Compare that to the blog network that we've set up, same environment, same topic, same people. Um, the blog people, again, about, like I said, about 114 people the diagram of that network looks something like this. It's very flat. It's flat because nobody is dominating. Nobody's dominating the conversation. Everybody has more or less an equal voice. Everybody, everyone's voice gets heard, and everyone is able to read everyone else. But typically what happens is people look at the list of blogs, and they pick and choose, and they get a perspective. So if we take a look in this course, we'll go to the daily. This is the daily newsletter that I send out to support the course. Again, it's something that's provided by Grasshopper. Grasshopper allows me to sign people up for a daily newsletter, and then I just send 
this newsletter out to people. Really what happens is I create a web page and I just send that web page to them. So let's look at today's issue of the daily. I sent that out this morning, first thing this morning, 5 o'clock. It was 9 o'clock where I'm from. So, so here are some resources that we highlighted. Here's uh, it's CBC coverage, Canada's national broadcaster. What was their headline? Connectivism, revolutionary educational movement, or nutso cult? Wow. Yeah, can you see the hierarchy working there? <laughs> Um, we had Valdis Krebs in. Valdis Krebs is a very well-known authority on networks, and he gave uh, a presentation uh, yesterday morning and then came back in for uh, a discussion later in the afternoon. We recorded that on Illuminate, which is what we've been using for our, our in-course our in -course chats, and that's available, of course, to anyone. All free. Everything, all of this stuff is, well, the Illuminate I don't think is free. But from my perspective, it's free because I'm not paying for it. And then, so we have the, the other recordings, and then uh, we've got concept maps. And then down here in the newsletter, these are the posts in the last 24 hours that people have done on the blogs. I haven't even bothered to put the Moodle posts into the newsletter because it's about, well, yesterday was about, I don't know, 400 posts. 380 of which were by the same three or four people. I'm exaggerating a bit, but not by a lot. Uh, but the Moodle posts, you know, the one-liners, the zingers back and forth aren't really very good for syndication. Uh, when, when content is being syndicated in this way, it tends to be more reflective. It tends to be more thought out. When you level the network, you tend to get better individual contributions uh, as well as a better overall result. So here are the, the, the contributions from the network and I haven't read well, any of these. Oh, yes, this is uh, one student is looking at connectivism, the idea that learning occurs in a network from the perspective of biblical interpretation. And I think that's wonderful. It's not the path I would have taken, uh, but the idea here is that for this subject, as for any subject, you have many interpretations, many points of view. People work according to their own belief system, whatever that happen, may happen to be, and they contribute their understanding and their perspective to the whole. And, you know, I mean, to fly an airplane from London to New York you need to do the wiring in the seats. And to get an understanding of connectivism, you need to understand it as well from a biblical point of view, among the other points of view. And that's, I just picked that one by random, because I don't know who's, who's there. I need to fix that display a little bit. <laughs> Although I kind of like not knowing whose post I'm clicking on before I click on it. And the idea is people select whatever it is that they're interested in. And again, I'm not... I haven't screened these at all. And, oh, that's the group in Second Life that got together. And, and you, see, you see the way this works now, right? You have networks within networks within networks. And that gives us this structure, this clustering structure. In a system like this, you can't possibly create the, the, the network equivalent of a contagion or an infectious disease it would be stopped part way through because it would be blocked by a particular perspective or it would be blocked by a particular organization of the network. And so the personal learning environment, what it is in the end, we'll come back to, to this, what it is in the end is a way for each individual, for each person, whether they're a learner or an instructor or a plumber or whatever, to have their own presence in the network, a way for each one of these people to be, as it were, a node in the network. And being a node in the network means aggregating, it means filtering personally. You know, you're not going to try to filter the entire network. That would be ridiculous. Um, and then feeding forward to your other connections in the network. 
key technologies that make this work. These are known collectively these days as Web 2.0. I'm not going to linger for a long time on them, but you need to know them if you want to know what it is that's making personal learning environments work, what it is that's making all of these different things work together. One of them is social networking. And by social networking, I don't mean uh, Facebook. I, I don't mean MySpace, although those are the most obvious instantiations of social networking today. But social networking from the perspective that people are connected to other people. They are not connected to everybody else in the world. They are connected to a smaller circle of people that they call variously friends, buddies, business associates, enemies, whatever. And other people are connected to other people. And so we have a network of relationships that creates in our society a mesh. You know, the distinction between the, the hub and spokes kind of network that produces the, the power law and the mesh type of network, it's, it's an interesting mathematical thing. Uh, the, the hub and spokes type of network, they're called a scale-free network. And what that means is that the same, networks, the same network principles apply whether you're talking about a small group of people or a very large group of, of people. But in nature, networks don't work that way. In nature, once you get to a certain point, physics takes over. Uh, think about well, nature. Think about things that we build even. Think about airports, airport hubs. Uh, the airport hub is your classic hub and spoke network. But... There's a certain point at which this breaks down. Uh, Chicago or Atlanta are about as big as you can get. Heathrow is bigger than you can get and still run an airport, as we've seen, right? Uh, physics prevents you from putting too many airplanes in the same place. That means that it can be a hub-and-spoke network to a certain point, but beyond that point, it has to be a mesh. And if you actually look at the network, you, know, you see hub and spoke kind of properties, but you also see mesh kind of properties. The curve would look more like that. You wouldn't have the big, big spike. You have Heathrow and, and Atlanta. I don't know what the airport in Atlanta is called. No hair, because I've never been to Atlanta. Maybe one day. I hear it's real nice. I want to wear a Pepsi shirt. Uh, <laughs> because I'm like that. <laughs> Anyhow, so the, the spike isn't quite as big. I wonder how that's, well, well I'll, I'll do the recording later. The spike isn't that big. There we go. Um, similarly, you have other network, networks of rivers, for example, and again, a classic, you know, hub and spokes kind of network, but rivers can only be so big. Trees can only have tree trunks that are so large. So there are natural limits to the size of networks in physics. And for people, there is a limit to the number of friends that they can have, actual real friends as opposed to Facebook friends. Facebook friends, the only limit is the number of people that they'll allow you. And I think it's something like 10,000 or whatever. So by social networking, I'm talking about networks that are formed by people who have actual limits to the number of friends that they can have that will produce this sort of mesh. And then also by social networking, I mean the technical infrastructure that makes that possible. And this will be a distributed kind of infrastructure. Tagging is another one of these technologies. Tagging, on the one hand, is a cute technology that produces things like those Wordle globs. But tagging, more importantly, is, uh, is a... Uh, I don't want to say democratization because that's not what I mean, but it's, it's um, basically ignoring pre-established hierarchies of vocabularies, also known as taxonomies or ontologies. The idea of tagging isn't so much that you can produce word clouds, but rather people choose their own vocabulary, their own words, in order to describe an object. And it is out of these individual, diverse, autonomous choices that we get what may be called emergent clusters or emergent categories. So this becomes this, this kind of diverse, autonomous way of describing the world becomes a different 
way of referring to the world, a different semantics of the world, if you will, an emergent semantics. And I won't go further into that, but trust me, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there. Major technology, it's called AJAX, not your sync cleaner. It stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And that's the, the little doodads that when you type into a web page, the whole page doesn't load, it just does a little flip-flop and you see something inside the page change. What AJAX is basically is a way for your web page to talk to a web server without having to reload itself. And that's a wonderful technology. Uh, it's produced by JavaScript function called HTTP request. There's now, there, there's going to be stages of this. Because AJAX, as it's now formulated, is site-specific. And what that means is you can't send an HTTP request to a domain that is different from the web page you're sitting on. If you're sitting on downs.ca, the HTTP request has to go to downs.ca. It can't go to Netscape or whatever. But there are ways, called tag hacks, of inserting JavaScript content into one page from another page. And that forms the basis of widgets. Is it there? Yeah, there it is. It's called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. JSON and AJAX working together basically create a mesh, and a very tight mesh, because it means that any given website can get content from any given server if it's provided in this JavaScript Object Notation. If it's not, you can't, because the browser prevents that from happening. How do servers talk to each other? Uh, you were probably brought up, uh, raised on the idea of web services, simple object access protocol, SOAP. That's not how it's going to work, mostly. Uh, large enterprise services, sure. But for the stuff that everyday people use, it's something called representational state transfer. And basically, what a representational state transfer is, is a way of associating a URL with data. And so using representational state transfer, one website can send a simple URL request to another website, get data back. And so the, the website can gather data from a large number of other sites. There are various things called mashups that have been created out there on the internet. You may have read a lot about that. That's how these things are being done. Various websites have application program interfaces or APIs, and other websites use those APIs and engage in what they call a, a RESTful transaction. They get information from other websites, mash it together, and then present it. And again, it's, it's all about producing this mesh. You know, the old internet, the old way of learning is you all, you, you come to the site. Everything comes to the site. Everything comes to Google. Well, Google may be a bad example. Everything comes to Facebook. Everything comes to the LMS. But this new way, it's, it's spread out. And you're getting your information from all over the place. So here's the, the application program interface and mashups. JSON, as I mentioned. And then finally, <coughs> OpenID. The idea here, and it might not be open ID when everybody's done with it, but it will be a user-owned consistent identity across sites. And this is what takes basically your social networking and merges it with your content services. If you have an identity that persists across websites, then the same person can be working with multiple websites at the same time. And if you have that, then you have a fully featured, full-fledged personal learning environment. I can, I, can have, I can go to my Grasshopper site, and from my Grasshopper site, I can go to Flickr, I can go to Google Docs, I can go to Gliffy, I can go wherever I want, to Skype, whatever. And I'm the same person, so I just fling my data back and forth between these sites as much as I want. So, I hope you found that, in, found that interesting. Uh, I wish the technology had worked a bit better, but I, I thought it was certainly worth experimenting. We still have some people who are uh, 
held in throughout the whole thing on the Ustream. Uh, thank you, Ustream people. It was nice to have you along for the ride. And I, I hope you were able to contribute to the uh, discussion. Not as many uh, posts up here as I thought we might get, and I'm really disappointed about the jing. But uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, thanks for, for being here. And we have three minutes for questions. Yes? I've got a better understanding of how we can create our own personal learning environment, but what if we want to encourage your questions to colleagues or clients? Is there a way to do that? I think the best way to do that is to demonstrate it. I don't think there's, there's virtually no way in the world you can tell them this, right? You know, you imagine walking into your client saying, well, you, you use a little Google Docs and a little Gliffy and a little Flickr and it'll all work for you. And they'll laugh at you. Trust me, I know. Um, <laughs> but if you show them, and that's a big part of what I tried to do with this talk, right? It didn't all work, but if you show them, and if you show them by doing this yourself over a period of time, what you will find is that you have put yourself in a position where you actually have an advantage over other people. You have access to more sources of knowledge. You have access to better knowledge. Uh, you're able to respond to things more quickly. Uh, you're able to do things on a dime. And then people begin, well, begin to ask, well, how did you do that? And then that's when... You know, your colleagues or clients begin to pick up on this sort of thing. Anyone else? Yeah? I probably know the answer to this, but is there a way to kind of monitor goals um, with peers of you who are on their own PLEs or track progress and achievements and things like that? Um, the, the short answer is yes. The long answer is that I think over time we will have forms of RSS, forms of syndicated data that report this sort of thing. But, but you know, we, we sort of have to be careful here because the dynamics are changed. It's not going to be you're spying on them kind of reporting anymore. It's going to be they volunteer, you know, they're, they're willing to allow certain types of data to be exposed and exported. And then the rest of it just simply becomes a question of, uh, of uh, standards and specifications. So there will be um, activity type RSS. There's, there's another word that starts with A that I'm, it's not attribute, it's, it's something. Um, that's, uh, but the idea here is that as you go through things, as you do things, you can produce a trail of data, but you own that trail of data, and that trail of data is exposed through your own websites rather than um, captured by some institutional server, which raises questions of reliability and trust, right? But you think about it, it's not really that easy to fake a trail of data. It's actually more work to fake a trail of data than it is to just go do those things. So. That's that's how that'll be managed. I, I can see where PLEs map nicely what we understand about communities of practice, which transcend right. organizational boundaries. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage that tension between when you're working with corporate clients as a designer, uh, pushing people toward PLEs right. with organizations that tend to be a bounded universe of meaning? There's an inherent tension there. Yeah, there is an inherent tension. I, I like that. Bounded universe of meaning. That's a wonderful expression. Uh, I think we're going to see a change in organizations, and I think that's going to be necessary and inevitable because organizations that become universes unto themselves will find itself find them find it increasingly difficult to maintain their integrity uh, to compete successfully. Uh, I was thinking about this, and I'm just totally intrigued by this, and which is kind of wrong because. I don't like to be intrigued by this sort of thing, but I'm thinking about military intelligence because it's you know, a bounded universe of meaning. If there's any classic bounded universe of meaning, it's the military that thrives on secrecy. And I'm thinking, I was thinking that this is a real weak point for the military, right? If you can actually damage a military by breaching its secrets, wow, uh, 
But it's a huge weakness. For one thing, it means that you as the military, you have to build a whole secrecy infrastructure so nobody finds what you're doing. And then, even then, you have to plan for contingencies just in case. Why, why not design the military so that it can survive data leaks? Wouldn't that be a better way to do it? Now, I'm not a military expert, so I don't know exactly how to go about designing a military that survives data leaks. But it seems to me that in a field uh, of, of conflict, the military that can survive data leaks has a huge advantage over the military that can't. And the same sort of thing is going to happen in, in the world of business. Businesses that do not need to depend on keeping secrets have a huge advantage over businesses that have to keep secrets. And it, it, just a simple resource advantage. Uh, you know, uh, your technology works. You don't need the whole data security division. Uh, or, you know, it could be some guy with a, a padlock or whatever. Well, I'm just kidding, but you know what I mean. So I think, now obviously, you know, it's not going to be so polarized as I've just described it. There's a range of possible, more secure, less secure. But in general, um, the less secure, the less securely you can run your company, the more of a business advantage that is. And so I see that over time, Companies that run more openly and less a self-contained universe will have this sort of advantage in the marketplace. That's my prediction anyways. And we can come back in 10 years and see if I was right. Thanks a lot and uh, may see you tomorrow. And thanks everybody online. And I'm about to turn off the recording. And I see you're still there, which is very nice. And uh, glad, glad you could participate, and I'm glad to have you. So I'm just looking now for my screen that will turn you off. So I'm going to be shutting this down here in just a second. Still looking. Oh, here we go. Down show, recording, one hour and three minutes and 39 seconds. Stop recording.